it's about it depends really on the density of other lions so when you've got a lot of lions in one area then you're going to find that the territories are going to be smaller because there's going to be a lot more competition now i can hear a few franklins in front they're not really alarm calling but let's just go and see they're making quite a bit of noise so you never know um so it depends on the density so the, the territory here in the sabi sands we've got quite a high density of male lions so their territories aren't as big as what you would see in other parts of the world and so the territories here are roughly i would say about 10,000 hectares which is about 20,000 acres so somewhere in that sort of vicinity is how big their territories are here um, if you go into other parts into the sort of desert areas like in Namibia some of those areas don't have a high density of lions and their territories can be up to a hundred thousand hectares or 200,000 acres so it just depends on the area itself that you sort of been able to look right now we're going to send you two and a half thousand kilometers or well miles should I say all the way to Brent Leo Smith and maybe he can tell us a little bit more about the lion territories up there how big the males have that side well, there we go, look at that, a Mara monster meandering upstream, uh, a Nile crocodile. I mean, looks like a big male. You can see a more bulbous head, they've generally got much bigger heads than the females. And of course that's because they've got to fight for all the females. And of course the time of plenty for them is soon upon us. Now, I have been bamboozled by that lion I saw earlier. I was convinced she'd be sleeping somewhere close by here. Now, Tristan was chatting uh, and saying I should discuss lion territory in the morrow. I think Tristan should discuss lion territory in the morrow. No, I'm only joking, of course. Um, so I, first I want to find the lion. That's, that's first and foremost. And I saw her walking along the edge of the tree line here. And we're in this beautiful forest um, of quinine trees and uh, diospyrus that's all along the edge of the Mara River here. And I was convinced I'd find her sleeping right here. I wonder if she's just not... And she, I thought she might be lying in ambush for a big herd of zebra that are moving past. But I think they spotted her. So the only other thing is she could have kept moving. Now, lion territories and lion dynamics here, we don't fully understand yet. And uh, it's going to be a while before we do, I think. And uh, I think they have seasonal ranges and, and ranges depending on what food's available, like any other lion, like the Nkuhumas move to the north uh, when uh, it's the wet season. They follow the zebra. Uh, the lions will have a set territory here, but I think it's a, a lot less rigid than than it is in, in, in southern Africa. I just can't figure out where she's gone. Just, just gone. I mean, we saw her. Okay, it did take us about half an hour to get to the other side of the marsh, but I was convinced I was going to find her. Well... I'm going to go see. Maybe she ducked behind us and uh, see if we can find her there. If we have no luck, well, then she's completely bamboozled me. I'm going to go look for some tracks on the ground, but it sounds like Byron's still behaving like a gorilla in the mist. <laughs> Thanks, Brent. Um, we still haven't had any luck. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to move out of this area now. That leopard has definitely given us the slip. Which is frustrating, but it's one of those things. I mean, it's... Also, the other, the other guys all moved out. They all went to go and try and have a look at that lion. It sounds like they got a view of the lion, so, so that's good for them. Um, but you never know, this male leopard could potentially stick his head out a little bit later. I'm just a bit worried though because, because it's still very cool and that leopard will most likely still move around a lot during the course of the morning. So if he has crossed a few roads and headed through some thick blocks, chances of finding him later are very, very difficult or very slim rather I should say. I think why don't we have a look what's at the waterhole. Let's just see if there's anything around here. Uh, I did find a 
little animal. Little dog. Little tree squirrel running around in the ground there. Uh, it's just gone behind that termite mound. Sorry. <laughs> it looks like everything's hiding away from me this morning. I don't know what I've done wrong, but <laughs> animals are disappearing and they're not wanting to stay, stay around for us. Uh, Craig, is it me or you they're afraid of? <laughs> Probably me. <laughs> Uh, Lauren all the way from Illinois good morning Lauren or good evening I suppose to you um, let's just have a look here quickly and Lauren asked uh, what the scariest uh, incident I've ever had in the bushes um, uh, Lauren I've been charged by one of my favorite animals once before just have a look at that mist though everyone look at that the mist over Vuyatela Dam you see how thick the mist still is this morning. <laughs> it's lovely to see though, but but um or not see because the mist is so thick. <laughs> um now the scariest I think uh, or closest encounter I've had, I was charged by one of my favorite animals, an elephant. Um it, I, I was by myself, I didn't have guests with me, uh, luckily, but um big bull elephant charged me. It was our fault though, we were trying to get him out of camp. But um, he, he turned around and charged and I fell over and he stopped. He stopped about five meters from me, Lauren. So that was the scariest encounter I've had before. Um, other than that, not, uh, yeah, nothing really. I've had, I've had one or two leopards growl at me a few times while we've been tracking them and they were hiding in a bush. But um, fortunately they didn't actually come out and charge. Just a, a growl. I've had lions growl. Um, also not a charge though, not yet anyway, uh, but that, that wasn't too scary, I'm trying to pretend I'm very brave here, you see, so, um, so yeah, that, uh, um, oh, I've had, it when my blood has gone cold once or twice, So, um, just um, one thing that has got my blood cold once or twice is seeing a black mamba rear up next to the side of the vehicle while we've been driving. That uh, That's happened once or twice and that gives me the, the, the shivers a bit. I must be honest. It's a, it's a snake that I've got a lot of respect for. I love snakes. I've got a lot of respect for a black mamba. And, um, and that, that definitely sends shivers down the spine. Now, Kirsten, you asked a question, and Alice, could you just repeat that for me, please? Um, what uh, Kirsten's question was, uh, some hyena tracks here. Ah, uh, Kirsten, yes, um, hippos may be, uh, may be out still grazing in weather like this. And, um, and you said that could potentially be scary, yes. Well, um, Kirsten and, um, it's uh, it's happened before when we've been off tracking animals and especially in winter you've got to be very very careful because you could move through thick areas and still bump into a leopard lying out of the water because if it's overcast or cloudy and it's in winter these hippos will go or feed at night but then possibly just go and lie down somewhere in a drainage line or not necessarily head back to the water because it is so cool and um, because the, the sun isn't out they don't mind being out out in the open so um, they may stay out of the water for longer periods of time so yes potentially there could be hippo still out feeding or grazing um, but you do always have to be careful when walking around especially winter when you are tracking because you might bump into something like a hippo it's happened to me before we've been walking and seen a hippo lying down quite far from the uh, from the water hole No animals on the clearings near camp at the moment. I wonder if we shouldn't try to check the hyena den quickly. Tristan did look this morning, but he didn't have any luck. It's a little bit later. 
So, so um, because it's a bit late time, I think I might try that. Let's do that. Go and have a look at the hyena den. See if there's any activity around there. And who knows, we might bump into one of those younger leopards that were around. I think Hosanna and Shungile, those two young leopards that we do see occasionally, they have been around. We've seen tracks of them and Tristan got to see one of them yesterday. I think it was uh, the young male. So maybe they pop out. He did have, Tristan did have tracks this morning heading towards that high in the den site of a leopard. Well, this mist definitely has brought a big change this morning. Uh, Michael, you asked um, if I've got any tip of the day for you yet. And I, I, I do. Um, just trying to think yesterday's one. Uh, yesterday's one, I was just saying how... I think, um, you know, when you do travel to, to Africa, or South Africa especially, um, there's, there are a lot of different places, wonderful places to visit. So try add on little bits and pieces onto a safari, like Cape Town. There's wonderful places to go to in Cape Town. Um, and then today's tip of the day was, um, what was it, I was thinking about it uh, yesterday. I had a thought while I was, um, oh, sorry, our aerial's just fallen down. Right there. Batman fixing the Batmobile. <laughs> uh, sorry, Alice, can you just say that again? Le Lexi's question, what has wandered into the camp? Ah, uh, okay, okay, Lexi. Lexi, now your question actually ties in with my tip of the day for, for Michael. Um, so, um, Lexi just asked what animals have wandered into camp before. Now, Lexi, I've had everything in camp. Um, I've seen leopards, I've seen lions, I've seen um, seen elephant, buffalo, hippo, all those animals wandering through camp. So you do have to be careful, and this is where my tip of the day comes in, is when you're on safari um, and you are staying in the camps, always, always be aware and alert of when, when you are walking around during the day. Now, uh, what happens is within the camps, you always get an escort in the evenings to and from your rooms. They will, um, uh, the, the, either the there's sometimes camp security or the guides will walk you back to your rooms and fetch you um, for dinners because just to be aware in case animals come through so if you are in the camps even during the day and you are walking around it's most of the time it is safe but still always have a look around for any animals and don't wander away from the camp at all by yourself um, that is just looking for trouble so always be very aware very alert when you are on safari um, and I'm, I don't mean to say this to to scare anybody not at all but it's just it's just you avoid situations and you avoid any any uh, potential danger just if you are aware and if you are alert so, and especially when you are walking through the camps because sometimes people get blasé and they think they're completely safe but the animals are still here we need to remember we are in their environment and they move around and uh, they will move through the camps as I've seen many, many times before. So just always be aware and careful. Now, we're at the hyena den site, but alas, there are no hyena. Uh. <laughs> Maybe it has got something to do with the weather, I think. I can see the entrance to this hole over here. It does look like there's been a bit of activity just off to the side. Um, you can just see that it just looks like some scuff marks in that around that hole. So it does look like there has been high in activity around here recently. So, um, but they're not out yet. Maybe later or maybe this afternoon we might have some luck. Anyway, I'm going to drive around, maybe head to some of the water holes in the south. Let's go 
back to Brent up in the Mara and see what he's managed to find. Disappearing lioness is uh, still a mystery. We've checked a little bit further down the along the riverbank. No tracks, no sign. Hmm. What to do? What to do? Well, there's only one thing to do: it's to go back to the last spot we saw her. And uh, as I said yesterday, we saw four different lionesses around here. I was chatting to one of the guides from Governors, and and uh, he said, oh, well, the one lioness we're looking at, her name is Yaya, and uh, she had two. Well, could probably almost call them adults. Uh, cubs with her, uh, just over a year old would be my guess, maybe a bit more. And uh, we're going to head, they were on the other side of the marsh to where we are now. So we are going to head that way. I just want to have a quick squiz through the forest. You never know, there might be a leopard here. Now James is wondering, is the Mara River a territorial boundary for the lions or could it, the, their territory encompass both sides? Uh, both sides, James, it's, it's not too much of a problem. Uh, the Paradise Pride are on both sides often. They swim the river, uh, well, not quite daily, but, 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 but definitely very often. And quite a few of the different prides will cross the river without too much, too much fuss. Of course, they've got to watch out for the crocodilians. Are there any crocodilians down here? No, just some hippopotami. Hello, hippos. Now, Isaiah, you want to be very careful when you come near the edge of the Mara River. As there's lots of undercuts in the bank, so I'm not going to go much closer than that. I think that is as close as I will go. Hello, hippos. Now, we're looking down upon them. I can't see any crocodiles. We did see that crocodile a bit earlier. Swimming upstream. Now, all the animals around here seem to be quite relaxed. I'm not sure where this lion could have gone. It's quite nice to look down on a hippo for a change. Well, disappearing hippo, we're going to keep moving. Uh, Nikki would like to know, are there any wild dogs in the Mara? Uh, there are, they're not very many. Uh, they have been very hard hit by canine distemper and rabies. So they're not too many wild dogs, but they, they are definitely around and I'm hoping that we'll get to see them. Hopefully as today even. You know, where on earth could she have gone? Okay, well we're going to keep meandering along and hopefully we are going to find one, two, maybe ten lions. So while we do that, uh, let's go see how a Byron's faring back in the low felt. Uh, Brent, still no luck on our side, um, but uh, again, it's too soon to panic. Don't worry, <laughs> we'll find something. Um, but it is a lovely morning. It's such a different morning. I mean, it is. It's quite cold, but not as cold as it was yesterday morning. And yesterday morning was quite cool, um, but I think this mist often it insulates some of the warmth from yesterday. Um, but you can. But just having all this moisture in the air, it's actually lovely. I, I do enjoy it. It's rid of some of the dust that that uh, we get in this in the winter. Chitty Chatty Meg wants to know if the cheetah have um, left for the winter or why there aren't any cheetah. Well, cheetah, cheetah in this area are generally quite rare. We don't see a lot of cheetah around here and the reason for that, there are a few reasons actually. Now cheetah generally prefer vast open landscapes. Um, so, um, for example, the Mara where it's very flat and open. The cheetah enjoy that because they enjoy scanning across the clearings, looking for their prey. They hunt them by running them down, relying on their speed and pace. Uh, whereas this area is a lot thicker and you can have a look. It just doesn't suit a cheetah very well. 
it's very thick um, and not easy for them to move around or hunt rather in conditions like this uh, or in areas like this habitat like this and also we've got a high density of other predators around lions hyena and leopard so that's a lot of competition for those cheetah and they don't like that either and the cheetah have to be very careful for the larger prey, uh, prey species or larger sorry larger predators because um, because what can happen is uh, if cheetah bump into lions for example the lions would kill them not for food but purely because it's competition so they do have to be very very careful so that's those are kind of the the main reasons why we don't see as many cheetah around here they do occur though and they do move through the area from time to time but uh, we haven't seen cheetah here for quite some time there's an Egyptian goose swimming <laughs> You know, it's a slightly quieter morning when we have to watch the Egyptian goose doing its morning lengths across the treehouse dam. <laughs> they are beautiful geese though, beautiful markings on them. Plenty of them around and you know, we've seen so many of them around Chitra Dam. Chitra Chitra Dam and um, there's some goslings around there too at the moment we saw the other day. But they are all over South Africa, a very abundant bird species. You find them everywhere, especially golf courses and that, even in the cities. You find them all over. Um, Mika, age 8, good morning or good evening wherever you are. Um, you asked, have I ever been hurt in the wild? Um, no, fortunately, Mika, I haven't. I haven't been hurt in the wild. Um, James has hurt me a few times. <laughs> He's beat me with a stick. No, I'm joking, he hasn't. Um, James has just shouted at me a few times. <laughs> but no, Mika, I haven't been hurt in the wild. Touch wood, not yet. Um, but you do have to be very careful so I, I do try and be very careful and especially when, when I'm with guests um, main priority is safety first always looking after guests but, um, but thankfully I haven't been hurt in the wild just yet um, and I say that because you never know and because we are out here constantly and regularly the animals are wild they can be slightly unpredictable at times so we do have to be careful, but no, I haven't, fortunately. I wonder if any of the other guides have been hurt in the wild out here. I'm not sure. I don't think so, but... I'm sure Brent has got some some answers of being hurt in the wild, maybe. But he's got some zebra up in the Mara for you. Well, we cannot find where this lioness has gone. She's just vanished. Now, I've gone along here. I've been looking for tracks, but the thousand zebra that have marched past here have made that quite difficult. And she's down here. Maybe she wasn't as far as I thought she was. Maybe she's lying in this long grass up ahead. But look at this, there's a line of zebras heading towards the others. Massive herd. Now, James is wondering what prompted the migration to start early. Well, it's, it's very simple. It uh, was a lack of rain in the Serengeti um, that caused migration. Oh, there's a bird. I don't think we have it on our Mara list yet. Hamakop. So, the migration started early because of a lack of rain. It's been a very dry year 
uh, this year and uh, that is pretty much why uh, the wildebeest and zebra started moving early. Here we go, little hummer corpse searching for frogs on the edge of the marsh. Hopefully it has more success than us searching for lions. But I mean we saw her from the other side of the marsh walking, the buffalo were watching her. Maybe she's just in this long grass here somewhere. Still haven't seen a track. Maybe she's lying next to that log. Nope. Now I've got a question for everyone out there. What in terms of numbers is the largest mammal migration in Africa? What in terms of numbers is the largest mammal migration in Africa? If you know the answer, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. I would also love to find a lion. Hmm. Oh, saddlebolt stalk. That's definitely another one for our moralist. Look at that. Absolutely gorgeous. So elegant. I mean, we've even got, uh, to the left of the saddleboard there, Senzo, we've even got our, our, our Mara policeman. And not even the Mara policeman, the topi is snorting. Keep coming. Left, 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 left. On top of the termite mount, nice and high. No snorting at a lion. What's going on, Mara policeman? You're not doing your job today. Hmm. I don't think... Wait, what is that in the grass? Oh, Zebra's having a little roll. It is a termite mound in the grass. I'm literally flabbergasted. I, I thought for sure we'd found that lion in two ticks when we came across this side. I don't know. Now, Mita, who's eight years old, would like to know, have I ever been hurt in the wild, I think was the question. Um, yes, Mita, but it's always been my fault. I've stood on thorns, fallen out of trees, um, and I had one, one bad encounter with an elephant, but it wasn't the elephant's fault. But you do get hurt, like anywhere. But it's still much safer than living in a city, living with lions, when you can find them, that is. Now, you've always got to be careful driving on the edge of a marsh. Oh, so we've got two answers in so far. One is water buffalo. Well, that'd be quite difficult since water buffalo... Oh, Rosie throated long claw! Rosie throated long claw! Oh, yay! I'm so excited! Jamie saw her first one a few days ago. I've seen quite a few of them. This is a really, really cool bird, guys. I will, I'll get back to the, uh, the incorrect answers now. Uh, let's try and get this rosy throated long claw on camera. Come on, land somewhere nice. Land somewhere nice. You got them there, Sens? No, come back! Bad rosy throated long call. There was more than one. Okay, let's not panic. It's landed far away. Um, and it's landed in the grass. Darn it. They are absolutely magnificent. They just have this bright pink. Um, oh, is that another one there? It is, but come back, come back, come back. Yes, wind, blow it this way, blow it this way. No, it's also going to land far. But 
if there's a couple of rosy throated long claws around here, this is a really good area. So uh, hopefully we'll find another one. And uh, rosy throated long claws are definitely more rare than lions. Okay, now we just go very carefully checking for rosy throated long claws. So we had an answer in water buffalo. Water buffalo don't live in Africa, unfortunately. They live in Asia. And I don't think they migrate. And uh, the other one was a wildebeest. Now, wildebeest, I think, are the third largest. No, I think, I know. Whoopsie. They're, they're the third largest migration in Africa. So, no one's got it right just yet. Okay, so, rosy throated long claws. They like this little short grass on the edge of swamps. Um, I'm sure we'll find another one. I'm going to keep searching. Well done, Johan, you are spot on. It is indeed fruit bats. About five million straw-colored fruit bats migrate from the Congo Basin rainforests to Kasanka National Park in Zambia. And uh, they go there to take advantage of, guess what? Being fruit bats, fruit. Yes, so very well done, Johan. And uh, I wonder, just for fun, is that the long claw, is that a lark? It's a lark. Um, just for fun, who knows what the number, the second largest my mammal migration in terms of number is, is. Uh, and uh, what animal is it? And where is it? Ah, I'm going to keep you guys on your t -t toes today. No, no. Hi, Lexi. Uh, Lexi would like to know what is my favorite bird in the Mara? Ooh, that's difficult. I think it's got to be probably the African blue fly catcher, or as Kirsten calls it, the Twitter bird. I think that's probably my favorite bird so far. So far. Um, I've seen some really awesome birds in the Mara. Blue swallows. Um, rosy throated long claws which we are trying to find right now given up looking for lions we're looking for rosy throated long claws now <sighs> not a rosy throated long claw now yesterday uh, we had some uh, major car problem and uh, problems and I ended up smelling like diesel by the end of the day and then we got stuck in a rainstorm. But I'm sure Tristan's going to pretend his car troubles were far worse than ours. Let's go find out. Well, I don't know if they are far worse than yours. Running out of diesel is probably at least a little bit worse. Well, in fact, I would just imagine if you uh, know that you don't have enough diesel, then that's not a good problem at all. But we have bent a massive steering arm on Rusty, which means that for now we are stationary and Rusty has got wheels that are sitting like this and they will not drive straight at all. And so we limped our way towards Chilapan in case our male lion decided to pop out here and come and have a drink. But so far, no luck. So we're now just sitting awaiting Opa and Connor to come to the rescue and so that we can then try and straighten this bar out or replace it with another one and then get on our way again so it should be not too much longer i actually think i can hear the car for opa and connor coming this way so they'll come to our rescue just now now interestingly enough i was looking at photos that i managed to get of that male line and it's most definitely not in suku it looks like nene so it's got the equal sign which i will show you fairly shortly so if we have a look now i've got to sorry now if we have a look quickly I will try and bring it up now if the camera wants to look but if we zoom in onto the nose there we go there's our equal sign over there well you'll see it shortly well done Ferg so there's the equal sign on his nose that we're talking about so it is most definitely our Nena that we saw this morning if I get that right I'm sure he's the one with the equal sign on his nose Nena and Suku often confuse me but that's who it looks like 
to me. Right, now Connor and Opa are here to come and rescue us. So we're going to try and see if we can't get this bar straightened at some point. And luckily there's no better person than Opa. Opa looks after our cars and he does a real good job of it. And he's always trying to kind of sort us out and make sure that we can get on our way and get moving. So we're going to try and see if we can't just get everything sorted out. And then we can join the drive again and take a little bit of pressure off Byron and Brent. But it's nice to have all the boys out this morning it's been all the girls recently so it's good to have all the boys as well right we're going to try to get this sorted while we do that let's go back to byron and see how his morning's been so tristan's broken his car has he oh dear tristan yeah, that's a little black dot next to your name in the book <laughs> well i hope he gets it sorted we're still driving around in the mist and we haven't had too much luck just yet. It's been very quiet this morning. We've had the odd tree squirrel running away from us. They haven't decided to stick around either. Oh, I wonder if it is purely because of the weather. Just keep having a look for any tracks or fresh signs of animals around that might have moved through the area once other vehicles have passed by that often happens drive through one area and then you get um, animals walking past after you've been there and again not too many antelope species either Jason, definitely. I, I do think so. You asked if the, if the mist would benefit some of the plants this time of the year. Definitely. And um, because there's so much moisture around, and I actually made a comment about it this morning, um, we could um, we could hear, or I could hear, the the drops of water falling off the leaves down into the grass. So there's that much moisture around that it's actually forming little droplets on the... Um, uh, on the leaves on the foliage so which is very very good for the plants so it would definitely benefit them looks like some hyena tracks here, old hyena tracks a lot of hyena activity around Ah, now Martha you've asked if any of the animals have a strange way of collecting water now I'm trying to think um, uh, no no not that I know of Martha I'm trying to think of any animals around here um, uh, why do you say giraffe <laughs> okay, so <laughs> Craig says, and I'm going to demonstrate, why not? Let me do that rather. So Craig says he thinks the giraffe have a strange way, I suppose, of drinking because um, because they, they walk up to the water and obviously with those long necks of theirs, they've got to go and they then got to spread their legs and then bend over to drink. So I suppose that's a strange way. <laughs> I don't know, Craig, do you think that consider? strange way. Um, one thing though, Martha, that I can think of is um, these little sand grouse that we get here, virtual sand grouse. Um, they do have an interesting way of collecting water. They'll go down and drink, but also they've got little, um, almost like little pouches under their wings, and they collect water and they store water under their wings. And that is then to be used for some of their chicks at a later stage, or for the birds themselves. So they do collect water and store water under their wings. So that's the uh, um, the uh, double banded sand. Did I say virtual sand grouse? Double banded sand grouse that uh, that we do get um, out here. Um, so that is a strange way, I suppose, of collecting water. But everything else, Martha, will go down to the various water holes, um, especially the prominent water holes in the winter. And then in summer, you'll have all these little puddles and little uh, mud pools forming. 
so those animals will be able to get moisture or water at least from any of those they won't necessarily have to go to the big dams they also will probably get a lot of moisture from uh, the vegetation that they're feeding on after rains because there'll be a lot of water on there so they'll get water from that too but in terms of actually collecting water no not that i know of that any animal out here in africa at least collects water actually collects water and they just go and drink when they want Now, Michael, I'm not sure if this mist will be enough to, to create any frog activity. I don't think so. I think because it's so cold and that I don't think those frogs will be very active. Um, and because it's not actual rain, it's just a bit of moisture sitting on, uh, on, the, um, on the vegetation. It's not soaking into the ground. So I don't think we'd see any frog activity or we'll get any frog activity from this. Again, just a lot of little spider webs around and you can see right next to me just over here more of these little tiny tropical tent web spiders and we can see them so clearly because of the moisture again as I pointed out earlier all the little dew drops in the water on the nests or on the the webs rather lovely to see them just shows you how much moisture there is around there you can see those little drops of water clearly on the on the web oh. um, Nikki you asked what is the strangest behavior I've ever seen from an animal? Um, now I'm trying to think. Well, I think some of the birds have strange behavior um, or strange um, displays that they do, especially during mating season. Some of the birds, I'll get back to that, but I'm trying to think of some of the larger animals. Um, Uh, I can't think off the top of my head anything really strange that stands out. Um, uh, no, I don't. Sure, I don't know. I'm trying to think. I've seen strange leopard behaviour in that, and um, and I suppose this is a good one. So the strange leopard behaviour I've seen is. Um, and now we we know that generally leopards are are quite um, quite solitary and and unless they're mating you'll see you'll see them uh, joining up or if there's a female with youngsters or cubs at least uh, she'll be looking after them. Um, I have seen, however, I've seen um, one occasion. Um, now males are very territorial firstly so you get they do compete for territory and dominance and often what happens is it's just a display so they'll walk up and down in a line next to one another on the edge of their boundary really and they try and intimidate each other they'll snarl they'll growl they'll salivate a lot scent mark so it's a show to show that they're bigger or more dominant than the other one however one occasion we got into an area that um, was the boundary between two big dominant male leopards. But what had happened was there was also another dominant male leopard in the area. And he had been followed by a female that was wanting to mate with him. Uh, so what actually happened was the one male uh, moved off to the side. He wasn't too phased about these other, other male leopards. But he did come and investigate because he could hear all the commotion. Um, these 
two male leopards then began to fight and a serious fight they were biting and scratching one another and really having a good go at it while this female was walking around waiting to try and mate with one of the males so we had four leopards together four adult leopards together in the same area it was an amazing sighting and very strange behavior to see how this female would hang around the one male just kept his distance and watched every now and then come a bit closer but never actually got involved with the fighting and these other two male leopards ended up fighting one another and eventually the one moved off and um, the female followed the other male but uh, very interesting behavior interesting behavior so that I suppose would be um, something very different and unusual that I've seen um, I saw something for the first time now on this trip that I just did to the Kalahari um, two sand grouse, Birchall's sand grouse uh, we don't get them in this area um, but they mated and then straight after they mated these um these birds actually again these display the displays that they do after mating and this these birds the male jumped off the female and he lifted his left wing up and he lifted his left wing up and as he did that the female got up and she lifted her right wing up and um, was it no sorry they were they were facing opposite directions so both lifted their left wings up um, and then they danced around each other like this. It was wonderful to see. I've never seen that before. So a beautiful little mating display after mating. So these two wings up on either side of the birds and they danced around one another. So that was very interesting and unusual. Anyway, speaking of interesting and unusual, let's head over to Brent. <laughs> Well, welcome back to the Mara. We decided to leave the search for the lone lioness and let's see what else we could find. And we found some Howards. So, you can see that hyena's been sleeping in a nice big puddle of mud and uh, just got up as we approached. But even more fun than that, we're quite close to what, one of the dens we think. Let me just go forward a little bit. And as we stood here, all of a sudden, these little heads popped out of the grass. Hi guys! What mayhem have you little troublemakers been causing? But it looks like they're also... Oh, there's a whole bunch of the little ones, or sub-adults, not really little little, and they're all in that patch of grass there, and in the mud as well. There we go, you see there's heads popping up everywhere. Hey little guys! Were you being big and scary and chasing lions around last night? Yes, were you? Or were you being chicken and running away from the lions? I think you were being chicken. Little fluff balls at this age. Now, of course, you can see behind them lots and lots of lots of and zebra and topi. So what we decided to do when we couldn't find the lone, lone lioness is we're going to make our way towards the big herd of zebra that we saw on the hill um, or at zebra and wildebeest and uh, we, we're getting there slowly but surely but there's always so much to see <laughs> Lulu would like to know whether zebras are gentle creatures. They are a complete opposite. They are violent, foul beasts that bite, kick, and absolutely annihilate each other if there's any competition. Um, zebra stallions will often kill foals that aren't their own by stomping them and biting them to death. So no, they're, they're not at all gentle creatures. They're actually one of the more violent animals you get out in the African bush. Now we're going to go see if we can find some fighting each other and we're going to move up towards that big herd. Bye little hyenas! So we sh we're probably going to take about 10 minutes to get to that massive herd of zebras up ahead. So I'm going to speed along and uh, while we do that you're going back to Byron it, Juma. Well, we've just seen a little bird that's hiding from us at the moment. It's a beautiful little crested barbet. Now, let me see 
Oh, oh there it goes. Where'd it go? Oh, it just flew off. It just flew off. A little crested barbet. Hang on, there's another bird up ahead here. Yeah, let's just see what this is. Just up here to the left. It looks like a little starling. Is it? Is there the hawk eagle in the nest? Oh, hang on. Hang on. Looks like our hawk eagles are around. Uh, just wait. Oh, there. Okay, I see. Well spotted, Craig. I think those are our pair of hawk eagles. African hawk eagles. Let's see. There they are. They are indeed. No, both of them are there. The one, one's actually obscured at the moment behind some trees, but that uh, just through there. But you can see the other one right up at the top of that branch. Wonderful. Um, and it's the first time I've seen them uh, since I last saw them building this nest, which was over a month ago. So it's great to see they still here. Yeah, there's that nest up in the tree that we saw them fixing. So I'm not sure if they've got any chicks at the moment. I haven't seen anything, but um, but they are at least still around, which is great. I can hear a woodpecker busy knocking too at the moment. Probably looking for some food. But those African hawk eagles are beautiful birds. I really enjoy seeing them. Great hunters too. Uh, Andrea, you said it's so nice to see this bird against that darkened sky. Yeah, it's a different, different view with the, the misty, misty air. It looks like this mist is starting to lift a little bit, though. Now these African hawk eagles. Oh, there they go. One flew off. Um, very good hunters. Very good hunters, and they'll feed on um, birds, other birds, a lot of the time. Franklins, guinea fowl especially, have seen an African hawk eagle feeding on a guinea fowl that it caught on the ground. So what they'll do is they'll sit up and then they'll swoop down and often they'll hunt in pairs. So they, because they're always in pairs, male and female, and what will happen is one may sit and possibly distract the birds and if the birds are watching it, the other one might come down and, um, and try and catch whatever it is that's on the ground. So they do really feed on a lot of birds. I think it's coffee time. I think so. I always say this. It's um, oh, Kirk, number 67 for your bird list. That's wonderful. That's really great. I'm glad the bird lists are all still ticking over for a lot of you. Um, now, um, as you know, when I guide uh, other guests, we do often stop for coffee in the morning for a little break. And I find it I always joke around and say, well, if we haven't seen much, maybe if we stop and sit and wait a while, the animals will come to us. So maybe that will happen. And then um, we've got our our little morning coffee. <laughs> oh, dear watcher, you asked how long it will be, be before we can see chicks of these um, African hawk eagles. Now, I'm not sure, dear watcher, because I don't know if they are actually eggs in that nest at the moment. I haven't seen those birds sitting on the nest for quite some time, so I don't think there are eggs that need to be incubated there currently. Perhaps they were just getting the ne nest ready, uh, maybe use it later in the season. Um, I'm not sure. So I don't know. I don't know when, when it will be before we see chicks, but we will definitely keep a lookout and we'll keep checking this area to see if there is any sign of eggs or chicks with the African hawk eagles. Now it sounds like Brent has got to that big herd of zebra and they're busy drinking at the moment. Well, we've got some zebras coming down to drink. It's not the big herd I was moving towards, but it was just such a gorgeous sight uh, that I couldn't help but stop. Now, I hear Byron has um, been having his morning coffee. I'm just going to try and move the vehicle a little bit closer. 
So in situations like this when animals are drinking, it's always important to start the car, let it run for a few seconds, and I can see they're relaxed, and then I'll move a bit closer. So I started a bit further away, and uh, I slowly move a little bit closer as not to spook them. See there's some walking in to drink, just arriving. Now, Byron's having his morning coffee, and uh, you know what? I think I'm going to have to one-up Byron today. Well, let's see, what have we got to one-up Byron? He's having morning coffee, but you see, I think what Byron forgot is that he's on game drive, and while one is having one's, well, you only one is only allowed to have one's morning coffee after they've found some animals. Now, of course, Byron is just drinking coffee because he can't find any animals. But you know what? Senzo, would you like some coffee? Yes, please. I think Senzo and I, since we've found a few thousand of animals, and have another cup there, please, Senzo. And see, and um, of course, we're, 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 quite, we're quite fancy pants here in Kenya. So, you know, no drinking out of tin cups or whatever. We, we've got proper ceramic cups. Oh, let me get my cooler box out. Because we're out, of course, for the whole day here. So we're, we're quite well stocked. Yes, now, unfortunately, we don't have to eat a goat anymore. It is over the days of eating goat. It was a trying time. Um, a month and a plus of goat. So there we go. Very nice brown sugar. Would you like some milk with your coffee, Senzo? Yes. Oh, wonderful. There we go. We've got some milk in here as well. See, this is how you do coffee, Byron. Once you've found animals, then you're allowed coffee. You can't have coffee before you have animals. Aha. Lovely Kenyan brew as well. Uh, Ruth, while I'm pouring my coffee, I says some of those uh, zebras look pregnant. Uh, indeed they are, Ruth. And zebras will give birth throughout the year. So there's also a very good chance we might see a live zebra birth. I'll pass you the sugar now, Senzo. There we go. And a spoon. Do you need a spoon? Did I pack a spoon? Oh dear. No, I did pack a spoon. I didn't forget the spoon and the milk. I, don't, I think this is quite nice. Whoopsie, making a bit of a noise here. An idyllic spot for a cup of coffee. What do you think, Ruth? Is it a good spot for a cup of coffee? I think it's a wonderful spot for a cup of coffee. Hello, Starlight. Starlight is wondering why would the zebras wade into the middle of the water like that one over there uh, to drink? Well, Oh, that's a good question. Now, you would think they would be a bit nervous of doing that because it's very possible there could be a large crocodilian hiding anywhere in in these little luggers that crisscross the Mara. I have seen some big crocs in them before. It could be that they just go, I think, personally, they're having a little bit of a respite from the plague of blighting, biting flies that are all over the Mara um, and that follow the herd around. So I think that's what's happening, uh, just having a bit of a break from the, the biting flies. So if they go into the water like that, um, they get nice and wet. And then also if they go roll uh, on the dust, um, also the dust will stick to them and maybe keep the flies away a bit. Augusta, hello! Uh, zebras are indeed from the horse family, which you we were asking. Oh, doesn't that sound lovely? And they are indeed from the horse family. I'm just um, passing some coffee back. Oh, you can hear zebras making noise. So they're actually far more closely related to, to donkeys uh, than, than they are to, to, to horses. But of course, donkeys are also part of the horse family. Yes, let me go. Wait, I need... Wait, where did I, what did I do with my cup, Senzo? You can't have coffee by yourself. So, uh, we got some lovely crowned cranes next to us as well. 
um, and we saw some of it earlier this morning but you can see we're still making our way towards that very big herd of zebra and there looks to be quite a few wildebeest in amongst them as well um, that are higher up but while we're down here we've got the lovely crowned cranes right next to us I'm very, very fond of Kenyan coffee myself. Well, actually, all East African coffee. I'd say my favorite coffee um, is uh, Kenyan um, or, or Tanzanian. Uh, Uganda and Rwanda also have some spectacularly wonderful coffee. Now, all coffee, of course, is African. And uh, so every single coffee culture in the world has its roots in Africa. Now, uh, most of well, the coffee actually comes originally from Ethiopia and uh, has been traded throughout the world okay so well I enjoy my coffee well let me just finish up, up on the coffee here quickly now of course as I said all coffee is African from Ethiopia uh, and was traded uh, via dows all through Africa so I'm going to enjoy my coffee with a bird well two crowned cranes a spur wing lapwing and a wonderful big herd of zebras and we're going to as soon as I'm finished I'm going to go park myself in the middle of the flies and sit with the zebra so from myself and my bird across to Byron and another <laughs> thanks Brent I hope you're enjoying your coffee up there in the Mara we've got a purple roller sitting on a branch it's always nice to see some of the different rollers we get out here and you can see it's actually quite difficult to see the color because against that bright almost whitish sky at the moment gray sky it's difficult um, to get the colors of birds like this if you are a photographer it's very difficult to photograph a bird that's against the sky much like this is gray sky or, or very light sky You'd have to overexpose a lot to get a good um, to get uh, that image. <laughs> Clouds Gate, you say you think the second biggest migration in Africa or to Africa of photographers? Yes, definitely. I think so. We have so many photographers coming out, enjoying Africa, and um, that's this trip that I just did recently, a 10 day trip with the guest, um, a very serious photographer, well, so serious photographer, it's more of a hobby and enjoyment, but a lot of camera equipment and it's a lot of fun um, trying to get images of different animals and birds and really working out the correct light and um, sometimes it can be a bit frustrating, animals don't always don't always turn the way you want them to or stand in the right light but that's the exciting thing about it it's looking for them for one thing and then trying to get that perfect image or or close to perfect image of whatever animal it is and the wonderful thing about photography too is because it's an it's an art form in a way so everybody's eye is different everybody enjoys a slightly different look to their pictures and um, you know with all the photographers that I drive and take them out and guests that are even if they're just beginning I'll give them tips and and help out a little bit with the photography but at the end of the day it's up to you what you enjoy from a picture and what uh, what you want from the picture um, but it, it does help to know a few little tips and how to adjust certain settings to maybe increase light um, or make the picture a little bit more vibrant all those little tips can help but uh, we did have a lot of fun on our trip now and we got some great images, saw some interesting interesting sightings see Brent, I'm also having coffee with you ah, uh, there's finally a little antelope, you see things start happening, if you just take your time and maybe have a little coffee break there's a beautiful female in Yala just off to the side. I wonder if there are others. I'm very sure there may be. William um, A. 
age eight, all the way from Oregon. Hello, William. And you said, can we find an animal that makes people feel better? Well, I think maybe the Inyala will make us all feel better. A beautiful female Inyala with those lovely stripes, those white stripes down the body. Very pretty little antelope. Always great to see the Nyala. I like seeing the Nyala because in these areas they're probably the most relaxed antelope I've ever ever come across. Uh, even when we're on bush walk or walking around camps, the Nyala for some reason are very trusting of people. They don't seem to be too nervous of us. And also driving around with the vehicle, they are very alert though. You can see big ears, they'll listen out for predators. And their eyesight is very good too. That one seems quite focused there. I don't know if it heard something moving through the bush. Maybe a little mongoose or something. It's just having a good look. Strange to see it by itself. I'm scanning around just to see if I can't find any others. But I just see the one for now. There may be some more in the thicket in front of that Inyala. Now, um, um, Mika, is it Mika or Mita? Um, Alison, sorry, I can't. Uh, uh, with the T, Mita. <laughs> and you also, age eight, and you asked if I could be an antelope, what antelope would I be? Hmm. Uh, let me let me show you a picture. I saw so in this area that I was in recently, Mita, there's some beautiful antelope there, but antelope that we don't get in this area, and um, and one of my favourite or probably the favourite antelope, uh, my or my favourite antelope is found there, and I'll show you a picture of one quickly. Um, hang on, there we go. Now. It is known as the oryx or the chemsbok. Now that's a very tricky word to say. Chemsbok. Um, it's an, a, a Dutch word, um, but they are also known as the oryx. Now those are one of my favourite antelope. Um, actually, the favourite. Very large animal, um, bigger than a kudu. And they can get up to about 250 kilograms, 240, 250 kilograms. So very, very large, long, sharp horns, but very beautiful antelope. And that, I would say, if I could be any antelope, it would probably be an oryx. And I think in this area, maybe, maybe a kudu, a big kudu bull. Um, I, I love kudu too, I do enjoy the kudu. So I think in this area, if I had to choose one, probably be a kudu. Um, I wonder, what would you be, Craig? A shy, timid Steenbok, perhaps? <laughs> oh, that uh, mist is starting to lift now. The sun is burning it off. I can see a bit of blue creeping through. So a bit of blue sky coming through. That's good news for us. Oh, Riti. Um, to be honest, um, best experience on drives, that would be very difficult to answer because they're all so different. Uh, I, I must admit, I must admit um, I think one of one of my favorite experiences was actually with a guest and um, oh, I mean we always see wonderful animals and see amazing sightings but for me probably the the best experience I ever had was um, 
and I, I've had two or three experiences like this. Where I had a guest that came out. Now, we understand, and I definitely understand, how difficult it is to plan a trip out to Africa or plan a safari. Um, it's also quite costly at times. So not everybody gets the opportunity to come out here. But when people do, for some people it might be a once-in-a-lifetime experience. And um, I, had, I had a guest, I'll never forget this, a few years ago. Family and um, first time to Africa, been a dream of theirs their whole lives. They've always wanted to come out, and um, and they wanted to see obviously as much as possible. They weren't very fussy about what they wanted to see, but but the mom really wanted to see um, it was giraffe and and rhino. She wanted to see giraffe and rhino, and. Um, and uh, we got to we got to actually we, we found giraffe the the one morning and she was so overwhelmed and so happy and um and that that for me was just a wonderful experience but then when we eventually got to see see some rhino she just burst into t into tears she was so emotional that she finally got to see wild rhino so that was for me such a wonderful experience i think um, it's often those experiences that stand out to me the most i mean the wildlife is one thing and it is amazing and i'm so fortunate to see it but um, but to be able to give people that type of experience uh, is uh, it's very rewarding and that's one of the reasons why I love doing what I do so I think that would definitely stand out but it sounds like Tristan has uh, has fixed his car that is broken um, let's go and see where he is and what he's up to well, yes we have well not I personally but Opa the can and brought a new steering bar and we now are back and running and Rusty is driving in a straight direction without its wheels being on its sort of flat edges. Quite funny when we were fixing the car. We had Kudu and Nyala alarm calling and squirrel alarm calling. and it all seems to be around the Mulawati area. Maybe it's Tingana because our line has crossed all the way north towards Buffel's Hook. He crossed over from Buffel's Hook Dam, so he continued on his serious mission through the bush and eventually came out at the dam itself. And so, I'm sure this must be Tingana that's causing a little bit of a ruckus here. He, his direction most of the morning was in a southeasterly direction. And so now I'm just trying to see if I can't find him popping out somewhere here. The Nyala and the Kudu that were alarm calling sounded like they were in this sort of riverbed itself. But we can't get into where it was. I found where the squirrels were. We found the Kudu and the Nyala. But no sign of any leopard right there. So I think it's down in the riverbed. But it's very difficult to get in there. Right. Now it seems like Iron, who's been talking quite a bit, wants to talk to you some more because he's found himself a very large animal. <laughs> I have been talking a lot, Tristan, but now we found some elephant, my favorites. Um, now, what I also, I also think is that if it's ever quiet and I need to find elephants, it looks like I just need to come to this spot because this is now the third time in a row that I've found elephants here. In the little drainage line of the... This is the Mulwati that we're in at the moment. Uh, look at that little one, just through the legs of this big elephant you can see little trunk, young elephant. <laughs> through there oh listen you can actually hear this elephant drinking the water oh this is lovely and again you see things start happening you just need to be patient eventually the animals will stop hiding and come out you can always rely on the elephant I wonder if they know that they're my favorites. <laughs> Snorting some of the um, water out of its nose, blowing it out. Uh, 
That's right, William. You asked for elephant, and you said you wanted to see them. So there we go, William. I'm glad we got to find some elephant for you. Oh, look. <laughs> oh, look at that. These elephants have been so playful in this area. For some reason, just... Uh, resting and enjoying laying down we've seen a lot of great elephant activity here and interaction <laughs> I wonder if it's a little bit of Resting or just uh, just deciding to to roll around in the sand a little bit. It's probably nice and cool <laughs> I sometimes feel like that elephant on the right <laughs> You just think well <laughs> Maybe I just need to take a nap <laughs> Can't carry on anymore <laughs> Violet, you said that elephant is done, done. Yeah, it's done. And again, this is such a privilege to have these elephants so relaxed that, especially that female, that she's happy to just lie down and not threatened by us at all. These others have carried on drinking. <laughs> yeah, Tess, you say, how can you not just love elephant exactly? And you know, in some in some areas, they do they do have a bad reputation. But I do think a lot of it is just how you approach them and how you behave around the elephants. You do always have to have respect for them and be careful. But but I don't think elephants will intentionally harm anyone unless you make them feel threatened it's like any animal animals are not dangerous they're potentially dangerous if we threaten them that's the only time really that wild animals become dangerous and again it's that respect that we always speak about we in their habitat we're in their environment we're purely here to view them and appreciate them and then we are able to get wonderful sightings like this the sun has now broken through Unfortunately, the gremlins are attacking Byron, so if it's not bent steering arms on Rusty, it's gremlins on Wendy. So I do apologize about that, but at least Byron's found some elephants. And I've been looking for elephants the last two days, and I can't seem to find them. And it seems they're everywhere but where we are. So we'll try again this afternoon and see if we can't find No luck on these alarm calls or any sign of any leopard. I've been looking for tracks, and I can't see anything. So I'm just going back towards Chelapan in case whichever animal it was causing the ruckus pops out at Chelapan itself. Now sometimes what can happen, particularly with Nyala and Kudu when they're in the same place, is a Nyala might be just off to the side of particularly a young Nyala and they move through a thicket and the Kudu then sees the Nyala and they bark which then triggers the other Nyala to bark and it becomes all a bit of a sort of fake news story and everybody sort of gets up and uptight about it and actually there's really no predator there so that can happen but the squirrel alarm calling was a bit fishy I suppose so I'm just want to check one more time at the actual sort of pan itself because we know that often Tingana when he moves this way will go Chilapan and then down towards Twin Dams and cross out southwards so it's worth going there and just checking and seeing if we can't find it now we're going to go through a little gremlin pit of our own in front and seems like Byron has battered his off and still has beautiful visuals of the elephants so let's go across to him yeah I don't know I don't know what happened there um, we just lost you for a second but uh, just as you crossed back to Tristan we had now oh, what look at this behavior the bigger ones pushing the youngster away that's not fair 
<laughs> doesn't want to share the water that's using his leg. Um, but while we were sitting here, <laughs> and f three more elephants came and joined. Right, have a look. And, um, so I'm just having a look at this female. Now, um, as I was saying, these uh, three more elephants came and joined, but these, this young elephant, we just heard these footsteps, came around the corner behind us and was running down the hill. <laughs> and then realized there was a car in the way <laughs> and slammed on brakes and didn't, <laughs> didn't see us. It was so funny. It got a bit of a fright and then just moved around and went and joined the others. And it was a wonderful little, <laughs> little moment with the young elephant. Now, Rajdi, you say the elephants seem to be super relaxed around me. <laughs> What's my secret? Um, I don't know, Rajdi. Uh, thank you. But um, oh, I don't know. It's, uh, I've always really enjoyed viewing elephant. Um, I I don't know if they pick up on your... Um, I do think they pick up on, on your emotions a little bit. Or if you... Um, at ease or if you tense, I, I do think so, or nervous, I do think these animals do sense that a little bit. Um, but a lot of the time just approaching very, very slowly, very quietly, and then sitting quietly. Okay, we've been speaking, but I've kept my voice at a, a very uh, low frequency, I suppose. I'm not, not raising the pitch too much, just a calm voice not starting and driving the vehicle around too much, all of that helps. If you just sit and park the vehicle and sit quietly, then then the animals do tend to relax a little bit. And we had these elephant walk right past us, not uh, not phased by us at all. Looks like it's going to be a lovely day. I can't believe that mist has disappeared completely. Ah, oh, Lime, where you say a dreamy eyed elephant? Yes, it is indeed. Now, I've just spotted some birds I'd like to show you quickly that are warming themselves up in the sun, up in the tree, that dead branch over there. Craig, look at that beautiful African green pigeons sunning themselves enjoying the the morning sunlight I think uh, Craig quickly come look what's in front of us <laughs> she's just decided to come and say hello it looks like it It's amazing. So I'm not going to talk too much. Let's, see, let's just see what she does here because she's right in front of us. So stick with us a little bit. She's smelling us. She's just curved her trunk up a bit. This is so wonderful. She's probably three meters in front of the vehicle. You can see how close she is. And there she's really, oh well, let's see where she goes now, hello, look at that, she's right here, it's amazing. That is really, really very close, but she's very relaxed. <laughs> and there she goes. That are coming out here too with the youngsters. I always think to be able to get this close to these animals, for them to be relaxed. And All right, well, I'm going to uh, link you across to Brent, he's got some zebra to show, and we'll sit here a little bit longer.
the elephant, but let's go have a look what Brent has got. Well, welcome back. We've finally got to this really big herd of zebras. I've actually driven through them. Uh, just to give you a, a sense of scale of how many zebras there are. So if we go across here, and I'm just gonna, we're just going to stay wide. We'll zoom in there. They go from there, and if Senzo, you just follow my hand. They go from there. No, no, stay wide, stay wide. So they go from, from about there, and they just keep going right the way in front of us. And the biggest concentration of them is actually, oh, over there. So let's go across that big group across the valley there. So there's probably three or 4,000 zebras around here at the moment. So Sens is going to zoom in for you there. Look at that. And they're literally spread at almost 180 degrees in front of us. And absolutely astounding and remember this is just the local migration this is not the main migration that is still on its way they're still around the sand river now, not many wildebeest in the section uh, the local migration of wildebeest seem to be closer towards the oh, uh, the top of the ridge and down towards Musiara gate let's get a bit closer to the zebra Remember, hashtag Safari Live if you've got any questions. This is just it. it it's, it's just, it blows your mind every single day when you, when you get to go out into a place like this and see incredible sights. I mean, I get just as excited about the birds and the bugs and the flowers as everything. Well, not so excited about all the flies that come with it, but uh, it's a, uh, batting all flies is a small price to pay uh, to live your life out in the wild. Now, at the moment, the zebras aren't doing too much. They're just milling about. Hello, milling zebras. Oh, you're having a million, um, well, no, there's not quite a million of them. There's lots of them milling about. Look at this, we're just going to roll into the zebras. Hi zebras. What's going on? Seen any lions? I saw one, I couldn't find it again. I'm surprised you're quite happy about that. Now, the wonderful thing when you've got such big groupings of zebras is you often see some very cool sort of um, stripe patterns. And we actually saw one who's got a white saddle. I haven't seen it today, but that was quite a long way away from here. But if you look carefully through them, there, there's always some very cool and intricate little patterns. Um, and you can see, and each individual zebra is completely different. That one looks like... It's got some stripy socks. This one here, these, these, this little group further closest to us here, sends, they look like they've got very stripy socks. Hipster zebras. That's very stripy legs. Let's see. Let's see if there's any scars. Oh, no, that one looks like it's been lion, lion free since birth. Rigi is wondering, uh, what is my best experience on these drives? Well, I've had so many wonderful experiences. I would have to say in the Mara, it's definitely been time with the cheetahs and uh, some of the hunts failed and successful that we have seen. I would say it's my highlight so far, but of course, I'm sure as we spend longer up here, the highlights are just going to become so numerous, we're not even going to be able to choose one at all. Now it's quite strange at the moment, they're quite, they're quite docile and quite placid and, and actually very quiet. So unlike being in a bigger herd, a herd of wildebeest, we've got that constant nah, nah, nah. Well there's one lone poor wildebeest. What happened, but? You lose everyone. There's about 5,000 of you just off to the north. There's a topian amongst the zebra there. That's actually, you can see how far away those zebra actually are. You can see the mirage or heat haze across the zebras. That's quite cool. Now we're going to spend, oh there's an eland as well. 
there's an eel in the bottom there as well. There we go. Now, we're going to spend the rest of our day in and around the marsh and this big herd of zebra. Uh, who knows what we might find while we're here. the day or before the sunset safari we will find said big cat and who knows what will happen next and that's the joy of being on a live African safari. So from all of us here and from me the only one who actually deserved his coffee this morning we will see you on the sunset safari.